Hello, my name is Robert P. and I'm a grateful member of Naranon. My topic is step three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. When I first heard this step, I thought, this is easy. I accepted the God of my understanding into my life when I was young. But honestly, by the time I got to Naranon, God and I weren't getting along all that well. God was not meeting my expectations. My life was in chaos. My addicted loved ones were out of control. And my God didn't seem to be doing anything about it. One day, as I was pondering my discontent, a stray cat stopped by. She had been stopping by a couple of times a day, and I kept some cat food outside for her. This time, she had three little kittens trailing along behind her. She waited until they were eating, then she took off, never came back. She had faith in a power greater than her understanding. She turned loose of her beloved kittens. The kittens showed up several times each day. One day, my neighbor spotted them and asked me to catch one. I got one to come inside and I closed the door. I gave him to my neighbor. He called him Chance because this kitten happened to get picked by Chance. Having seen that Chance seemed to be happy inside, one of the other kittens ventured in one day. This one I could not catch, so I called him Scamper because he ran so fast. The next time I opened the door, he ran out. He and his other outdoor brother continued to stop by and Scamper would even venture inside once in a while. Eventually, I called the third cat Rumpelstiltskin. If I see Chance in the window, he responds when I say his name. If Scamper's eating and I say his name, he might come over and let me pet him. But I've never been able to find a name that Rumpelstiltskin responds to. Then, one day, I opened my door and Scamper came running in. He dashed about, found my closet, buried himself deep inside. He's been with me ever since. Well, except for the occasions when he scampers out my door when I come home with groceries. But he's always back in a couple of hours. I think my relationship with the God and my understanding is rather like the story of those three cats. I thought my relationship with my God was like that of chance of my neighbor. I accepted God, and that was all there was to it. At least, that's what I thought it was like. But when my life became unmanageable, I had doubts. For a while, I tried living like Rumpelstiltskin. I knew God provided for me, and while I was glad to accept whatever God provided, I was not willing to go where I was called. Now I've settled into a relationship more like the relationship between me and Scamper. I need to open the door once in a while. I need to water my plants. I need to go buy groceries. Scamper knows when I'm getting ready to go. He hears my keys jingling. From wherever he might have been, he always gets to my door before I do. He's a smart cat. He's also a fast cat. He can dash out that door at the tiniest of openings but he generally doesn't. He usually chooses to stay, just like I choose to stay connected to the God of my understanding, a God who leaves the door open, hoping I'll choose to stay. This understanding helped me answer question six on page 23 in the Naranon 36. What does turning my will and my life over to a higher power mean to me? My answer now is that I have a relationship rather like Scamper does. I know I need my higher power. I know I resist and go the other direction, even when I should have known better. I'm glad my higher power always takes me back when I return. Now, I told you about the three kittens, but the other part of the story is the example set by the mother cat. She cared deeply for her kittens, but they needed more than she could give them. So she turned them over to a higher power who could provide for them. What would have happened if she'd not turned loose? What would have happened if she'd insisted that she alone would provide? She and her kittens would have suffered. Cats know these things. There comes a time when the mother cat must let go. I also need to be willing to let go. I can only control what fits inside my imaginary hula hoop. 
The 9 on 36 quotes from the blue booklet when it says, If I'm willing to stand aside and let God's will be done, I free myself from personal anxiety and a mistaken sense of responsibility. A straight cat knows how to do this. Why do I have such a hard time with it? Question 5 on page 22 really helps me see my part in the chaos of my own making. What decisions have I made for the addict in the past, and what were the results? I have a friend who told me about a weekend step retreat. The leader on step 3 gave everyone a stack of paper. He asked every person to make a list of all the things they had done for their addicted loved one. He asked them to be thorough. After 10 minutes, he asked them to stop writing, even though they were not yet done. Everyone had long lists of things they had tried, and almost everyone could admit to doing pretty much the same things. The workshop leader then asked everyone to flip the paper over. He asked them to make a list of all the things they had tried that got the results they expected. And the room was quiet. My friend said you could not even hear the scratching of a pencil on paper. I know that nothing I ever tried worked. The only one I can change is me, and I struggle to even do that. Have you noticed that step three in the Naranon 36 includes a section on the serenity prayer? The serenity prayer helps me separate what I can change from what I cannot change. I can make a long list of all the things I've already tried, but instead of focusing on the person I cannot change, I need to focus on myself. Then I need to focus on changes within myself. Question 31 on page 27 asks, How have I used the serenity prayer in my personal life? I use the serenity prayer to ask the God of my understanding to give me what I need, not what I desire. The kittens cried when their mother left them. I've cried, cursed, prayed, yelled, and screamed when God did not give me what I wanted. Yet I always had what I needed. Once I accepted this, I learned the meaning of God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Question 33 on page 28 asks, Am I learning what recovery and serenity can mean to me? In responding to this question, I start with serenity. Serenity is the North Star I use to navigate my way through challenges. Not short-term denial. That just leads to a false sense of serenity. Instead, I seek serenity as a long-term goal, even when it means making difficult choices. Step three says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the God of our understanding. Ooh, did you catch the subtle change I made when I dropped the masculine him? Let me say it again in the way that I understand this step. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the God of our understanding. I cannot change the words in our steps, but I can change my understanding of those words. The God of my understanding is not limited by masculine or feminine stereotypes. The God of my understanding knows I might make a rash decision to run away. The God of my understanding always welcomes me back. The God of my understanding is far better at taking care of my loved ones than I am. I need to trust that the God of my understanding, who cares for me, is also ready and willing to take care of my loved ones. So, thank you Earlier, for allowing me to share. I highlighted the word learning. I learn by going to meetings. I learn by reading. Four of the step books I like the best are the Narnon 36, the Narnon 12 step program, the Alcoholics Anonymous Big Book, and the Narcotics Anonymous book called It Works, How and Why. More importantly, I learn by doing. I learn through trial and error. I learn by recognizing a situation and then calling my sponsor. I learn by repeating the same mistakes until I figure it out. Turning my loved ones over to their higher power does not mean I do not love them. What it means is that I try to distinguish helping 
from enabling. If I'm doing something that the other person can do for themselves, then I'm enabling. Enabling is like telling the other person that I think they cannot do it for themselves. I'll give you an example. I was once on a committee. This committee was responsible for some of our shared property. In this case, it was intellectual property, but it could just as easily have been physical property. One member wanted to use our property for a special project she had in mind. Soon, members of our committee started taking sides. We discussed, debated, and voted over and over, but we could not reach consensus. We got input from World Service, we got input from a member of the Board of Trustees, and still this one member insisted on taking our property for her project. When the disagreement threatened to become physically violent, I left my service position. If I had acquiesced to that person's demands, I would have enabled her theft of our property. And once the situation became physically threatening, there was no way I could help. The best I could do was detach and trust my committee friends to their higher power. Step three is all inclusive. I need to trust the God in my understanding with everything. I need to trust God with my life. I need to trust that God will care for my loved ones. I need to trust that God will care for all the people I encounter every day. And I need to trust that God will care for my Naranon friends. This does not mean I abandon everyone. I need to stop enabling, but I can still help. When trying to distinguish helping from enabling, a key criterion I work with is to ask, am I focused on the problem or am I focused on the solution? Let me clarify. If my loved one asks for money and I say no, then subjectively, she's presenting me with a problem. And subjectively, my no is a problem for her. But that's a subjective perspective. That's not higher power's view of the situation. This is not a game of football where one team wins and the other loses. In higher power's game, everyone wins. But first, I need to pass the ball over to higher power. When I say no, I give higher power a chance to bring me to serenity. I also open the door for my loved one to turn to higher power. I can no more force my loved one through the door to recovery than I can get Rumpelstiltskin to come to me. But by opening the door, I give my loved one the same opportunity I gave Scamper. There came a day when I had to turn my loved one over to her higher power. I was not ready. Her higher power was waiting for her when the life of being an addict was bottoming out. But she resisted, and I kept enabling her. Her higher power sent messengers to warn her of danger. Some of those messengers wore badges, some wore robes. But she resisted, and I kept enabling her. Her higher power was accessible through the pastor who ran the outpatient treatment. Her higher power was present in the rooms of the recovery meetings we attended so she could get her court card signed. But she resisted, and I kept enabling her. When the judge ordered her to choose between a lockdown treatment program or prison, she chose treatment, even though it was a program that did not allow outside contact. I took her there. Like Mama Cat, I did not want to say goodbye but there was no alternative. Higher power was waiting for her in that program, but she could not see it. She only saw bars on the windows and locks on the doors. And I was still not ready to stop trying to be the intermediary between her and her higher power. Slowly, I turned to Naranon. I came to the meetings. I came to believe my higher power could change me and I decided to allow my addicted loved one to find her own way to reach her higher power. I did not turn loose all at once. I was ignorant. I could look back now and see the mistakes I made. But at that time, my choices seemed perfectly logical. When I got to step nine, I made amends to myself for not knowing what I did not know at the time. Turning things over to God takes practice. My loved one and I separated, and I could have looked at the situation and said all the problem was on her side. Instead, 
I kept practicing my skill at setting boundaries. Then one day, she had a crisis and needed help. Not enabling, but help. She was in the process of moving from one apartment to another, uh, but she misunderstood. She gave notice to move out of her old apartment at the end of August, expecting to move into the new apartment that weekend. But she did not understand that the new apartment would not be ready until November. I could have said no, but that would have been detaching, but without love. Instead, I chose to detach with boundaries. She could sleep on my couch, but only for one week. She had to show me a list of places she had called every day to prove she was trying to find someplace temporary. And she did it. She worked hard. In three days, she found a room she could rent for two months. I was glad to see how she took responsibility for her own situation. I was also glad I'd been practicing how to set boundaries. The thought for the day for July 10th in the Narnon Sesh book says, When I feel there is nothing I can do, I remember that a power greater than myself can change what I cannot. Then I release the addict and my expectations to my higher power and find peace and serenity. This is the hope we find in step three. Turn your will and your life over to God. Turn your loved ones over to God. Turn everything over to God. And you can find peace and serenity. We find hope. Narnon does not offer promises because promises are just another way of creating an expectation. Expectations of others only lead to resentments. And that's what led me to my estrangement from the God of my understanding. I had unrealistic expectations. Step three offers hope. This is what step three means when it says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. I said earlier that I mentally reprocessed the words of the step to remove the masculine him. This is why step two comes before step three. I must first find a higher power that I can trust. This is also why step one comes before steps two and three. Until I admit I cannot do it myself, I have no reason to search for a higher power, and I have no motivation to turn loose of anything. Once I accept steps one, two, and three, then I need to practice. At first, I might try to just sit still for 10 minutes and think before reacting. I can practice this in the numerous interactions I have every day with others. Sometimes when I really want to jump into the middle of someone else's responsibilities, I just sit and say the serenity prayer. I may sit for 10 or 15 minutes and just keep on repeating the serenity prayer. I have a friend who sometimes repeats the serenity prayer for an hour at a time. The key is to find some way to calm my mind and give myself time to turn loose of whatever it is that's bothering me. Once I learn to turn things over to God, then I need to practice patience. If I do not get the results I want in the time I'm willing to allow for God, then I have a tendency to take back what I'd worked so hard to turn over. I've learned to have patience with myself. Turning things over to God, trusting and waiting is a skill that requires practice. For me, the key to step three is practice. Practice with small things. Try bigger things knowing it will be hard to do and knowing it will be hard to resist the temptation to take it back. Practice because this is a new skill. But don't be disappointed with some initial failures. And don't be disappointed if once you have this perfected, you realize you're not perfect. Forgive yourself for your failures and then try again. I'll close now with the Narnon prayer we use with the third step. Higher power, guide me on my journey to peace and serenity. Help me let go of self-will and turn my life over to your care.